Povedal bom nekaj, kar verjetno večina v tej dvorani še ne ve. Skratka, ta knjiga je pred štirimi leti in pol izšla pri američki zaročki senja tekste. Doživela ji je 15 prevodov v najrazličnejše jezike tega sveta do zdaj. In vsi prevodi so bili narejeni po angliški izdali te knjige. Jaz sem seveda to knjigo dobila v roke v angliščini, ko sem se prikopala do kontakta direktnega in nosilcem pravic te knjige, sem ga prosila, sem rekla, zakaj bi delali mi prevod prevoda, če lahko prevedemo to knjigo iz italijanščine. In ko sem je avtor poslal italijansko verzijo te knjige, sem ugotovila, da manjkajo nekatera poglavja in da so druga poglavja krajšena, zgoščena. Skratka, črtana pa so predvsem tista poglavja, ki govorijo o premisliku italijanskega operaizma, plot operaizma in rekla sem, mi tega ne bomo črtali, ne bomo delali prevoda prevoda, delali bomo prevod iz jezika, v katerem je ta knjiga nastala. In zato je pač pravzaprav to edina izdaja na tem svetu, skratka knjigo v italijanščini ni šla, avtor že pet, šest let ne več ne objavlja v Italiji. Skratka, knjiga je, kar se da, blizu izvirniku. Poleg tega pa je avtor za to slovensko izdajo napisal poseben predgovor, samo za to izdajo, kar se mu res pozdravljujem. Nisem se mu že zapeljila. Skratka, tako da veste, ta izdaja je enkratna in jedina na vsem svetu, sprejši naše poreji, ki je vse verjetno morda predavalo. Skratka, gre za zadnjega v nizu dogodkov, ki smo ga pripravili v teh treh dneh, res intenzivnih treh dneh druženja s Frankom Brernim Bifom in že planiramo nove dogodke. Ampak v tem več naslednje leto bomo na se uresnečijo. Hvala, uživajte in predajem se posebno moderatorju po Lišiču. Lep pozdrav, moje imen, moje imen je Zdrav, jaz sem jaz smo delil v Evropu v Domizo, uradni jezik v Angliščina, so jaz svič na Vrindiš, in jaz hope that it will serve our purpose well. Thanks to Cyril and Amelia for their introductions, and I will also again introduce Franco, Gerard Bifo, and uh, Nicole Jeffs uh, is here today to discuss the book. So, Franco, as we all know, is a theorist, a media activist, uh, among other things. For decades, he has been a regular contributor to all kinds of debates on the ways of contemporary capitalism and on the possibilities of human separation from it. Um, his personal biography includes being part of the movement about Union in Italy. 70s. Uh, he was among the founders of the first pirate radio station in Italy, famous Radio Adice. And analyzing, articulating, and organizing social transformation in real time, that time brought a lot of uh, curious police attention also, and that eventually led him, as so many other Italian comrades of the period, to seek exile in France. Once there, he established a long and productive relationship with Felix Gattari. And then, as the highly networked world of today was slowly beginning to take shape in the early 90s, he focused his research more on the internet, on the cyber, and the curious life of the network itself. So, he has published numerous books on the new economy and movement of the cognitive media activism relation to communication power, new pathologies of semi-capitalism and the lot of money. So, uh, we are honored to have you as a guest today to discuss uh, the book of yours. My second guest and our second guest today is Nikola Jeffs, a writer, a filmmaker, currently employed at Facultatis of Humanistische Studie at the uh, University of Timorsko. He is also a member of the editorial board of Josephine Dichtus Namaste, an academic journal. His 
primary research interests are sociology of literature and post-colonial studies, but also he has a rich activist biography starting from the Alternativa of Ljubljana in the late 80s all the way through the destruction of Yugoslavia, <coughs> occupation of the Delta Autonomous Cultural Center, and then all the way through no global struggles at the turn of the millennium until today. So I'm also honored to have uh, Nikolai uh, discussing this book uh, together with Franco. So Franco has been in, in Ljubljana for a couple of days already and he has spoken quite a lot uh, about many different topics today. The idea is to focus more on the book itself. As many already explained, this is, uh, is a unique uh, achievement you know, on the global scale. So uh, definitely it deserves uh, all our attention. So we speak about the book Dusha Matelo and the idea is that uh, Frank and Nikolai uh, will guide us through the main ideas of the book and as well uh, the idea is that this is a discussion of all so if at any point starting from the beginning you, uh, any of you members of the audience have the uh, desire or uh, wants to say something wants to ask something wants to comment please raise your hand and the work will be given to you uh, i think the formalities are concluded so let's start uh, at the beginning Franco. Um, the title of the book is Soviet Work. So uh, it's not the concept of uh, soul, it's not widely recognized as useful concepts for the demands of uh, class charter. Uh, you acknowledge this yourself in the very open passages of the book, and you warn the reader that uh, the soul in the jurisdiction world is definitely, it doesn't have a lot to do with the soul. But still the question remains, uh, what do you mean by soul? Why is it that it is at work and what does it have to do with our lives? But the, the word uh, soul uh, is hard to be a concept. Uh, at least uh, I don't uh, use that word uh, as a serious concept. Sort of metaphorical and ironic way to talk about many things that are many things that are happening in, in the social sphere nowadays. Not nothing to do with uh, the spiritual uh, dimension. Uh, rather, I think to James Silver, who speaks of so many many points of his work. In a sense, which is the, I mean, the, uh, the psyche of, of, uh, of the Greeks, uh, but actually the, the metaphor of the soul is, the, is a way to speak of many different things with, uh, with the same, uh, um, with the same uh, word. Many things. Yes. First of all, our um, uh, cognitive activity. This is a level of the soul. But also uh, what Spinoza calls the effect, uh, which means the ability to be affected, the ability of being uh, uh, able to, to change according to the change environment of the bodies that are surrounding me and at the very end uh, the, the, uh, the ability to feel pleasure and to feel suffering which is very important in the definition of the political problem of, uh, uh, of exploitation and of autonomy in the age of financial capitalism and of quality work. Can I, yeah, one of these now. Um, can I just say something about the soul, or maybe, maybe um, in uh, 
Frank is also, well, he's the author of a number of books, but um, one of his latest is called The Uprising of Poetry and Finance. And in a section of that book, uh, Frank talks about the need to invent a new language. And <coughs> that new language is poetry, because poetry is, you can't exchange it. It has no exchange uh, value, no direct influence. Uh, <coughs> and I think we should take that concept seriously. And the thing that I found interesting about the soul, I know in the soul at work you say, basically, we, I don't want to use, I don't want to use the word with all its metaphysical, historical, religious baggage, etc., etc. But if we take the soul as a metaphor, if we think of it poetically, then it becomes quite useful, I think. And um, just give you some examples. Uh, the soul is a good way of thinking our present conditions. Why? The soul lives in an, in an eternal present. The soul has no past, no future. As historical beings, we find ourselves in the same moment in time. Historical consciousness is being erased very, very quickly. Capitalism, as you know, as you know, tries to give us this impression that we live in a continual present. With regards to the future, we don't have a future. Thinkers of the right, like Fukuyama, remember his hypothesis, history is over. There will be no, no qualitative change. Society has reached a developmental form in liberal democracy. No other development is possible. You have thinkers of the left, like uh, Franco here, also talking about this idea that there is no future. So, in a way, we live also this condition of the soul, right? We live in this eternal present. Now, we live it also for two other reasons. Now, if you take the classical conception of the soul, of course, you need some kind of metaphysical transcendence, which is a fancy way of talking about God, okay? You need something a signifier who delimits, delimits the soul. And we are living in conditions, of course we live in a very secular age, but at the same time we have something rising above us, don't we? We have, we have something delimiting our ethical relations. And what is that? That's the internet. That's the internet. That is where everything is being stored today. Where everything is being stored and at one point, judgment day will come along and each individual shall be judged according to his or her actions. And I mention the internet because, as you know, we live in, a, in the age of Snowden, Edward Snowden's revelations about the extent of surveillance. And of course, people have been very critical about the degree of surveillance going on through the internet. There is no privacy on the internet. What I find very interesting is that um, one commentary that was lacking was that basically, if you have surveillance, that is one thing. You can get, you can escape from surveillance. The problem is, once you know that that surveillance exists, you start living in conditions of self-censorship. And so I think in this post-Snowden era, in this era of mass internet surveillance, we will start acting <coughs> as though we have this giant power over us that controls, follows everything we do. And we will start acting in ways that will be deeply conservative. And again, you can draw the parallel with religious thought. You can see how, for instance, a, 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 a very religious would also be controlling him or herself. Of course, I speak this as a Protestant or somebody who's brought up as a Protestant, but you can see the, the parallel there. And another thing, why the soul is very, very good, in this age of cognitive labor of the cognitarian, I think we tend to um, forget one thing. Now, most of us if I'm honest, I, when I was 16, I went to work in a factory for two weeks. Uh, 
and this is what I did. Okay? And at that point, I decided I was going to become an intellectual. <laughs> and <coughs> I think it's terrible. I don't understand. I, so, a, lot, a lot of things aren't clear to me. I don't know why physical, why manual labor is paid less, valued less than intellectual labor. That is something that I find very bizarre. I don't know how money works. That's also, I've never really understood money. Things like that. But the thing about, I was talking to a student of mine whose parents are working class. His mother is a cleaner. His father is a bricklayer. And I was complaining how much work I have to do. I have to do 10, 12 hours. And the thing, the difference between cognitive and manual labor is that nobody expects a manual laborer to work for 10, 12 hours for seven days a week or even more. For cognitive laborers, for the cognitarians, that is somehow expected. And where does the soul come in again? Why I think Bharati's use of this concept is so useful, so potent, so poetically potent and powerful, is the soul does not abide by the limitations of the physical world. And the cognitarian lives in that condition where it is given work as though it itself does not abide, there has no limitations in the physical world. So you can just work for 8 hours, for 10 hours, for 16 hours, for 20 hours, for 10 hours, etc. <clears throat> so, um, the main process that uh, also you are investigating is the uh, uh, transformation of work itself under uh, the pre present mode of capitalism, that you call semi-capitalism. So, uh, and that you have already uh, somehow introduced this topic, so maybe, um, can you, in a way, um, just outline again uh, where do you see these changes Labor is, is 
it's not, uh, then I don't like that the definition because labor always is material, also it is absolutely uh, cognitive in a way labor implies the, the, the investment of physical, erotic uh, energy of, uh, of the the bottle is there when you are when you are knowing, inventing, or uh, uh, looking for information, and, and, and so so. The, 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 my idea is that the, the defining difference is the transformation of the cycle of production, in the sphere of work and the sphere of capital accumulation, in terms of scene. Uh, of science, of information, if you want, uh, info capital is, uh, is another way to say, to say this, the same thing. The essential change is there. Then I know very well uh, uh, that uh, um, today the industrial workers uh, are much more uh, than they were 30 years ago. I mean, we are not talking of the disappearing of the distribution of industrial work um, by a quantitative point of view. Industrial work has enormously increased in the last 30 years. The problem is that the, 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 um, the, the difference in the organization of the physical industry work itself is in the sphere of, of informatization. I mean, how is it possible that industrial work can be uh, totally deterritorialized, displaced, delocalized, uh, fragmented, recombined? Uh, this, this is also the explanation of uh, the process of organization and the process of disempowerment, of political disempowerment of the industrial work. Many, many friends tell me, uh, oh, you are talking of cognitive labor, but the workers in China or in Brazil uh, are, um, are more numerous than they were uh, in Torino um, 40 years ago. And that's true. The problem is that the, the 100,000 workers in Torino uh, were politically powerful because they were totally territorialized and capital needed their territorialization. Nowadays, uh, if the workers of Shenzhen ah. decide to revolt, uh, to uh, ask for an augmentation of their salary that uh, uh, the Chinese capitalist does not uh, like, in, in overnight, the factory is the origin there, but in uh, Vietnam, just name uh, a place. Um, but where is the source of this uh, uh, new force of capital? Where is the, the, the source of this disempowerment? of industrial labor uh, in the informatization or semiotization of, of the cycle uh, of production. So when at the, the same time, uh, this is a way also to understand what precarity is, what precarity means, essentially precarity is uh, not only a juridical form of relation between uh, the worker and the capital, but, but also the, the, the evidence, the, the experience that lies and the territorialized, uh, the, territorial, the permanent the territorialization of work. This is the real foundation of organization. Yeah. Well, maybe just as a comment, I think, I think that the, the notion of precarity is very useful, um, again it's very potent, um, 
but I think it's, it's quite important, I think, to keep in mind, um, because these debates happen in Slovenia, and it's um, sometimes what happens in these debates is that one dimension is lost, and that is, I think we have to keep in mind that precarious labour is the original condition of labour in all class-based societies. Labour is arbitrary. That's one thing. The precariat is not new. Uh, precarious labour, conditions of precarity, are the original conditions of capitalism. Historically, we have had a precariat for a much longer period than we much have had, yes. let's say, the industrial working class, as we would recognise in the forties regime. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is important, we want to avoid Eurocentrism. And that is that when we look at conditions of precarity and where is the precariat located in the majority, where have, where have precarious conditions of labour existed for the longest time? It's in the global south. Found silence, wretched of the earth, landless peasants, the urban London proletariat. That is the precariat, right? Um, and uh, it's important to keep this in mind. Why? Because, of course, capitalism has different forms, and semi capitalism is just one of them. But we also live in a world in which 50% of the population is still rural, in which 40% of the population is net networked. So we have roughly 50% of the population outside these urban industrial precarious models, and we have 60% of the population outside uh, this, these net networked regimes of labour. And what that means is that we have the, the coexistence of different forms of capitalism. Now, I, I do agree with, with Frank who says that semi capitalism is a basic form. But what these different coexisting forms mean is that probably in the future we will have to rethink our strategies of emancipation. They will have to be much more plural than they were in the past and take these different realities into, uh, into uh, consideration. So I think when we think about the precariat, when we think about conditions of, of capitalism, we really do have to have a Back to this uh, question of emancipation later. Now I would like to maybe that we speak about depression and pathologies that you also write extensively in the book that we are discussing today. So the theme that you are developing is that uh, the technological advance is increasingly producing uh, a world of chaos and this this orientation from the from the standpoint of human being, so endless flow of information. Internet, etc., etc. Uh, probably few of us can even uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, track everything that's going on on day to day level. So, and all of these, all the impulses and the speed of the whole development means that we as humans, with our uh, uh, limited mental capabilities, uh, are unable. We are no longer uh, able to process. All in a way that uh, we used to. So, inc incapability of cognitive workers to orient ourselves adequately in the new landscape defined by semi capitalism produces new subjectivities, produces uh, new pathologies, produces uh, uh, generalized depression, panic. Um, so, depression and panic somehow becomes. Uh, essentially characteristic of the soul at work. Um, <coughs> Alan Ehrenberg, a French psychologist, in a book titled La fatigue d'être soi, the, the fatigue of being uh, myself, uh, oneself, uh, explains that uh, contemporary depression uh, is essentially the effect of a social um, black medium, I would say also of the social of the creation of a social down by 
in the precise Vaxclavic uh, uh, or Beethoven meaning. Beethoven describes the, the double bind as an injunction which is contradictory. Be spontaneous. How can they be spontaneous if you order me to be spontaneous? And uh, actually, the question in, in the of generalized competition is a systemic effect. Either you win the, in competition or you lose. If you win, that means that all of your life has been dedicated, of your life has been dedicated to something which is not in your life, but the accumulation of economic power and so on and so on. Or Lose and you are socially culpabilized for being a loser. Whether the game is a lose lose game since the beginning, and the people, no, people don't know, but feel uh, this. Uh, they, the, the effect is depression because you think that winning in the competition is the only possible game. So you are losing exactly the only possible game which exists in our world. This is about, uh, is, um, about depression. But also, I'd like to say something more about this, uh, this subject, because the problem is that it's solved. So how can I come out from this, uh, from this uh, uh, um, condition? Um, Felix Quattari uh, said that the problem of depression is not uh, uh, a therapy of normalization, of uh, reconduction, of uh, trying for the individual to a, a good uh, norm. The problem is, he says, refocalization. And refocalization essentially means uh, um, changing the, con the social context, the, the, the environment of your expectations and of your performance. Of your, it's not easy, of, uh, of course. Now, I see that uh, on another uh, side uh, of, uh, of the psychoanalytic uh, the theory, uh, some ones uh, are, some, some uh, psychoanalysts, for instance, in, in, in Italian called the Massimo Carcati, who is a very interesting uh, thinker, uh, who, uh, very interesting, but wrong, uh, and it happens sometimes to Carcati and people, and uh, he's uh, trying to explain the present depression in terms of connection, uh, of, uh, uh, of, um, of hyper expression. I totally agree with him. I mean, I totally agree with this uh, uh, theoretical when he says uh, um, the, the uh, liberation, let's say, of desire has unchained the psychic energies in such a way that we are unable to deal with the reality of limit. So, and uh, up to this point, uh, I, I follow. But then he tries to find a, a way out and he says the problem is uh, the reaffirmation of the role of the father. Essentially, we have lost the father. Uh, and uh, and the, the only way out from this depressing situation is the reconstitution of the Lacanian name uh, of the father. I don't know, there is something um, true in that, but I I, I don't think that the reconstruction of the father is the way, also because it's a utopian way. I mean, how can you reconstitute the, the force of law in, in a reality which is totally uh, deregulated? And I think that the problem is not the father, the problem is the mother. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it's there you, you find the real source of the problem. The problem is that the disappearance of the linguistic body of the mind. The problem is that 
that uh, uh, the, 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 the present generation is a generation that is learning more words from the machine than from the body of the mother. And when I say the mother, I am not talking of a woman biologically. I'm talking of the body. The mother can be a father, but not the father of the law, the father of the body, the father of the affective relation that gives you the possibility of understanding that this is aqua. And this is aqua because my mother told me so, not because the signifier is linked to the signifier. So the access to reality has become frail. And the pressure is essentially an effect of this precarization of, of, of language, of our uh, uh, relation with, with language. Um, Nicolai, well, it would be the, before we want to touch on this uh, topic of no future, this uh, value is uh, right to be accessible now. Um, so, um, you have been also in your writing, uh, dealing constantly with uh, the revolutionary project in all its uh, promises, aspirations, failures. And you, you often say that, uh, of course, future is uh, you know, part and parcel of any revolutionary project. So, what are then the implications for the project if we suddenly uh, are left without a future? Well, um, let me just say something about depression. So I, I, I cheerfully recognize myself in uh, Franco's writing about uh, depression. And I, 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 yes, depression is one of the conditions really huh, trace it. To the, uh, to the effect of capitalism and also the degree to which you cannot reintegrate once you are uh, depressed. I mean, you find it very, very hard to be economically and socially to reproduce um, yourself. However, the, 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 the way the Frank writes about depression, that's, that's one territory, the way uh, depression is increasing in our society, the way in which, for those of you who haven't read the soul of the work, Franco writes a lot about how uh, large sectors of contemporary society need various forms of drugs in order to survive day in, day out. Prozac, for instance, we talk about the Prozac economy. So that, those kind of medical interventions are becoming integral uh, to our society. Now, I should say that uh, Franco also writes about suicide. And he sees suicide as the way out, the ultimate refusal. And there's a lot of truth uh, in, in that. It's only through suicide. I think it was Alvin Kamin who said that suicide is the only real philosophical uh, problem. And through suicide, it's the only way an individual can reclaim his or her subjectivity, become the full subject of their own life. <coughs> now, I understood that um, quite literally. It's a very disturbing thing to read, but I'll connect suicide to what you asked me, Andre. And I think that, of course, suicide can be a way of rejection, but there's also a life beyond suicide. And that is, in the sense that once you contemplate the fact that you can terminate your own life, and you take into consideration that you're going to die anyway, I'm sorry folks, that's just the way it is. The human condition exists that way. Then a whole new sea of possibilities opens up. You can take chances, etc., etc. And I think on the individual, as it is on the individual level, it's very the same. It's the same on the, the, the social level as well. I should apologize. I'm getting my teeth reconstructed, so I have to find this. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, Franco does write about the fact that we do not have a future. There are many different elements. Franco can enumerate them a lot better than I can, of course. Uh, but we don't have a future because what? The computer is taken over. Uh, humanity is no longer the subject of its own history. The resources of the planet are finite. We don't have great utopian projects anymore on 
the horizon, etc., etc. But once we take that into consideration, once we say it's over, basta, game over, nothing left, once we reach that point when there is nothing to live for because the future doesn't exist, a whole new sea of possibilities opens up because we literally have nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. It can't get any worse. I mean, I know John Cage said, don't try, and he was an anarchist like me, and he said, don't try to change the world because it only makes things worse. Well, no, that really is not true. Things can only get better. So once we face that finality of ourselves as individuals, the finality of the world as it is, then we can start taking chances. And this is the spirit in which, again, I read Franco's views on suicide, but also his views on the lack of a future and a possibility for meaningful change. Let, let me say something about the the no futurity, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is not my invention, but the invention of uh, a group of young people in London 35 years ago, when the action was taking power inside the Tories, and uh, was starting a uh, uh, triumphal march towards uh, the, the, the transformation of the world, and uh, the declaration that there is no such thing as society. So, no future is the other side of the same coin. Uh, you said that there is no, no such thing as society, but I ask you that there is no future. Uh, it's also, in a sense, is a, a constatation, a description of, but it's also a, a, a sort of strategic, uh, a, a, a strategic sentence, in a sense, of future. You know, when, when you pre precarization, and precarious exploitation is essentially based on the idea that I don't give you a salary. You are an intern, internship is not a salary, but I give you credit. So tomorrow maybe that you find a salary, and tomorrow you find someone who will tell I don't give you a salary, but I promise when well, the precarity is based on the rationale of the infinite promise. Uh, of, of, uh, of a better salary or a salary um, at all. And the promise of growth, in exchange of this promise, you give me your life. And one day who knows? So please, stop talking about the future. Let's talk about now. That, that is, uh, I mean, by the point of view of, um, of the, 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 the social struggle, it's a mental way to change the landscape. And then comes suicide. Actually, I do not prescribe suicide. Uh, as I am a, a, a militant, uh, I should be the example in that case. And uh, it's not my, my intention uh, to do that. I, I, I simply try to describe uh, the phenomenology of, of, of the current uh, reality. And the current reality is, first of all, in the last 30 years, according to the figures of the World Health Organization, suicide has increased of, listen to me, 60%, right? 60% in the last 30 years, which are the years of the neoliberal uh, triumph, and also the years of collectivity. And so on. So I, 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 I'm looking for a relation between the neoliberal competition suicide uh, and virtualization of daily life and, uh, and, and, and suicide. Uh, at the end, uh, this is the phenomenology of financial capitalism. If you look at the effects of the financial, so called financial crisis uh, on the environmental policy, of the powers of the world, look at the Copenhagen summit, look at the Warsaw summit, what is the effect? <laughs> Forget about the future of the planet. The planet is committing suicide because we have to deal with the rescue of the banks. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I just say that this is connected to, to what Andrei said and what you just said? I mean, I, um, 
an author that you um, that you refer to a lot and has been very important, Jean Baudrillard, who once said that um, the problem with, with ideologies and practices of emancipation, he was thinking of Marxism specifically, <coughs> um, is that they, 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 they have this ideology of deferral. So, and what this means is basically, comrades, we have to work a little bit harder now in order to be free later on. Uh, we have to be more disciplined now in order to be more free later yeah, on. So you're constantly deferring this, um, this lived experience of emancipation, this real existing, I know this is a, a box more, but real existing uh, 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 utopia. And when, when you think about it, I mean some of us here today, I'm sure we've had activist experiences where activism has, instead of friendship, hierarchy and discipline and uh, a, a lot of political work in the most disgusting of senses and by which you escape to the real world because you can have fun, you can relax in the real world, you can uh, be yourself. And just to round up my thoughts, I think this idea that there is no future is very, very important just for the reasons that Franco said. Because if you stop thinking about what the future will bring, will we have a classless society? Uh, uh, will we have communism? Will we have this? Will we have this in 20, 50, 100, 200 years, etc., etc.? That is all deferral. If you think of a society of individuals in which there is no future, where do you live? You live in the here and now. You start taking chances. You live through this sea of possibilities. Let's speak about politics now in, in, in the way that uh, you also uh, write about it. Like on three, I mean, let's say, you start uh, like in the foreword, in addition, right? Politics is no more strategic role. What remains is corruption, violence, and crime. And then at the very end of the book, you also somehow uh, you say that uh, political speech has to give way to therapeutic speech. So you speak about uh, changing politics for therapy. And uh, this, this sounds um, quite definitely uh, for, for those of us that uh, somehow we're always trying to uh, you know, navigate the Northwestern passage to the revolutionary society, or to the classic society. So, and I, but, I, but from um, yeah, but all, all the, the discussion and everything else, it's clear that it's not the difficult position that you are taking. So I would like you to elaborate more about this shift from politics to therapy and, uh, and what does that mean for, on the level of social uh, conditions? Well, first, first of all, we should better define the concept of politics that uh, is a, a, an overused word that means everything. And, and so by many points of view, I cannot, uh, I mean, they are still taking the definition of politics, the, the human being, uh, Zone is uh, large for me. I prefer to think uh, of politics in the sense of Machiavelli or in the sense of Vladimir Mussolini. Both think of politics as the art and the technique of the season. Of, uh, um, and what is the season? The season is the ability to cut one possibility among many, among the Maybe, hmm? not infinite, but maybe. Uh, the problem of the, the presupposition of political decision is uh, the ability to master information, to the, the, the ability to know enough, not to know everything, but to, to know the relevant uh, uh, alternatives. 
Um, so this is possible in a social situation, in a technological situation, in which the relevant information is rare, scarce, relatively uh, um, controlled. Uh, we are out from that situation. The, the essential change to the level of, uh, of uh, information in politics nowadays is the infinite proliferation of the sources of information, the infinite proliferation of the flows of, uh, 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 of uh, stimulation, informal stimulation. So, um, we, we have become unable, and when I say we in this case, I, mean, I say the political brain has become totally unable to control the infinite complexity of, uh, of the world. I often refer to a discussion between uh, Jürgen Habermas and Niklas Luhmann in uh, they met in a public conference for, for a discussion on the problem of uh, the future of information and the democracy. And the, the good uh, rationalist, Jürgen Habermas, said more information, more democracy, of course. You want more, you, you have the possibility of uh, understanding and elaborating more. And the, the malicious of Nicholas Luhmann answered that I am not sure of that. Probably when information becomes too thick, too uh, present in our landscape, at that point we become unable to uh, understand, to elaborate, and to decide about the relevant. Um, uh, so, uh, actually, what has happened? That, in my opinion, is exactly what the humans predicted. We um, see that, if you, you, you listen to the, the discourse of the, the politicians of the European Union, for instance, they don't say government, they say governance. And the linguistic shift is very important. Government is the intellectual ability decide, uh, rationally decide. Um, Machiavelli says that the prince is the male who is able to reign on the fortune, the female, the, female, the chaotic female, the, the infinite chaos of nature and the powerful masculine decision of the political power. Well, it's all the masculine over because the feminine riches of uh, the chaotic reality has uh, escaped to our ability of, of control. So happens. If you want to create power, if you do not accept chaos as, as a good thing, uh, politicians are unable to understand the problem, uh, you need governance. And governance is the replacement of decision with automatisms. So the relevant decisions are in a sense uh, automated and incorporated and embedded in the deciding machine. What happens in the field of uh, financial uh, it is all about that. The automation of the decision that violence is the defining force of present politics, so the politician is only a sort of uh, uh, employee of the financial uh, automatism. Then, so what is the job of the politician? Uh, to, to take some part of the money and put it in pocket. The corruption is no more a, the bad side of political action, it is the alpha and omega of the political action, as the political action is now. 
Of course, I am not talking of, poli of politics in this way. I am not talking of politics as conscious action of transformation of our life. That is a totally different subject. I don't call it uh, politics uh, because I don't like the terminological confusion. So I call it therapy. Pardon me? Therapy. You see, I call it therapy. And I know it's uh, an ambiguous word, but it's uh, my beginning. I, I am looking for the world to find it. And I will not find the world uh, if we don't find uh, the thing, the new form of conscious ability change our daily life. I think uh, we are missing interventions from the audience. And I think right now we really... Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. I would like to ask something in regards to the therapy we were just talking about. To find the sense directly, uh, we imagine therapy as some sort of aesthetic practice, right? So we, uh, sorry, sorry, can you uh, just give me the mic in front of um, so my question is in regards to the therapy we were just talking about. Uh, if I understand correctly, you imagine therapy as some sort of aesthetic practice, an um, artistic practice, uh, and the aim of this practice, according to you, should be redirecting the flows of desire away from um, well. Property or away from away from competition and um, other um, interests that are like determined by the capital, right? So I mean, basically, I was hoping that you could elaborate a bit on uh, how do you imagine this artistic practice as therapy to, to proceed, or and where I mean, where do you imagine this practice? As Explain, explain this a bit. Thank you. Yes, when, when you use the word uh, aesthetic, you are touching the, the, the point, the real point. Uh, etymological aesthetic uh, is uh, something not so much with art, but the much with perception. And the problem is the social aesthetics, the social perception. Our perception is disturbed by the acceleration of the infosphere, by the uh, generalization of competition, and so on. So, the crucial problem is a problem of uh, tuning, of resynchronizing uh, the, 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 the social perception with uh, the, the surrounding, with the environment, as info environment and so on. So think of the movement of Occupy, hmm? that I consider a political failure, but an extraordinary uh, invention at the level of um, a possible therapy. Why those people have decided to occupy uh, the squares of Spain for a month? Uh, six million people staying uh, day and night there. Uh, why, why the practice of occupation of the public space? By the political point of view, it's a um, little bit uh, inefficient. It's producing nothing because in the in the square there is not the power. You can occupy the square, the street, you can also occupy the bank. And it's nothing because the real power is not there. It's in the cyberspace, it's in the virtual relation between computers. So occupy is not a, an efficient, a, an effective, not efficient, an effective political action. But it's a poetic act of reactivation of the social body. The body comes out from the room, from the, the computer space, from the cognitive repetition of the virtual act of connection, and in the place of connection, you have an attempt to conjunction 
to recreate the possibility of a bodily conjunction of the erotic body of society. This is terrible. I know that Occupy is over in a sense because at the very end uh, we have become aware of the fact that the stakes were too high and the process of the activation of the body uh, were unable, was unable to become a political process of change. So the change is the general sisi or the horrible morsi or the Nazist Yushchenko and, and, and so on and so on. So, Occupy has opened the possibility, but has been unable to critically transform that possibility. But uh, it's the beginning of a process. It's the beginning of a process of displacement of the energy of society from the level of political confrontation to the level of autonomy. And what autonomy is? Is the ability to leave that alone. Do you want to make war? Do you want to be corrupt? Do you want to decide and to steal and to accumulate? It's your business. We are going elsewhere. Our bodies are going elsewhere. The problem is finding the elsewhere. It's a real, poetical problem. Uh, in this sense, yes, I mean, it's what I mean. The, the, the therapy is a political act. Um, any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. If not, I think I think that I, the therapy of the political act, yes, because I think that the, the, the problem that we face today is the face of our problem. Now, what I mean by that is when you when you when you switch on the media and listen to politicians, they talk about markets, they talk about interest rates, they talk about this. These are all abstractions that abstract. The fact of what people are losing their jobs and being thrown out of their homes, that individuals are suffering in various forms. And yes, we do the same thing. We also abstract. We denounce capitalism, don't we? We denounce capitalism as some kind of abstraction, and yet that it is people that make capitalism. Now, I know things have changed, and I think that this is the um, one of the great contributions of the Occupy movement is being to locate, personalize the nature of our, of our problem. Who oppresses us? It's the 1%. We are the 99%. And that is important. Why? Because our own social relations, they determine the kind of society uh, we live in. And what we have to do, therefore, is to reconfigure our own social relations, our own personal uh, relations. And this is why, for instance, Occupy, I'm not as skeptical as you are. I think Occupy is, it comes within a trajectory of movements and uh, forms of opposition to go from Occupy uh, to various demonstrations back to the anti war demonstrations in 2003, uh, demonstrations in Seattle in uh, 99, the Zapatista uprising in Mexico in 84. Uh, the revolutionary events of 68, etc., etc. We can go back in time and we can see that Occupy is part of that, but it's not the end. It's maybe just the beginning or, 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 or an element in, in the middle. So that is one thing. People were there, they learned to do relations. The other thing is, I think it's a very useful concept. When we talk about politics in emancipatory, with an emancipatory framework today, we talk about prefigurative politics. Now, earlier I mentioned this problem of deferral. It's temporal deferral. You defer your emancipation to the future. Okay. Prefigurative politics works against that. Why? Because you act in the form of the individual or society you want to be. You act that way in the here and now. And in this way, you also you not only defer, you know, again, you're working against this deferral to the future, but you're also replacing the burden of responsibility. So it's no longer some elite, some 1% that you or I will never meet in our lives, but it's our own relation to the way we act uh, that have the possibility of, well, 
changing society. Slowly, but nonetheless, uh, surely. So I'm not sure about, you know, I, yes, this is, yeah. Um, audience? Anti-Erdogan, who is 
representative of the sort of uh, um, uh, of uh, alliance between uh, uh, secret service, military, and uh, Islamic uh, forces. So, the, in Turkey, you have a sort of, uh, and as a consequence of the Gizipat, not as a consequence, after um, uh, uh, post hoc, not proper hoc, uh, as an effect, uh, no, as a consequence, no, as the, the after the movement, you have the polarization of two, of two fascist forces. But the same is happening in Egypt, the same is happening in Spain in a different way. You have the movement, then a, 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 the rise of the Catalan independentism, which is very well managed, <coughs> democratic, and uh, uh, friendly, if you want, and peaceful, maybe, but uh, I would not say the same of the Madrileño uh, Partido Popular, which is the, the direct descendant of uh, the Falange of Francisco Franco. So, what happens is that the inability of the movement of party to produce a political effect of consolidation of a, a social front of resistance is the uh, unchained, unchained the, 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 the deployment of a, a double form of uh, repression. Um, so the, 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 the movement becomes a sort of uh, excuse of possibility of uh, regulating uh, the, the, the conflict inside, uh, inside the power. So uh, I don't want to say that uh, I, I don't like, uh, I say the occupying is over, forgive me. Um, um, it's, uh, it's never a good thing to claim the end of the movement when you don't have an alternative. But my problem is this. Um, the, the specificity, the novelty of the movement of the time, like, like you, in the history, in, 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 a 50 years long history of movement, uh, of uh, self-organization of society and so on and so on. Um, the novelty of Mumbai has been, in my opinion, the recollection, the reconjunction, uh, the reactivation of the erotic social body in the physical space. The coming back of the body, in a sense. But be aware that the coming back of the body is a difficult game because the body that comes back is also the fascist body of power. Yeah. We are calling, yeah. in a sense, we are calling back the most horrible form of... We show our unity here today yeah. in yeah. 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 That, that is the problem. This is why I say, just uh, wait a minute. We have to better understand what is our possibility. We have come out, and it was necessary, uh, as a force of physical occupation of the city. Now we have to be able to transfer this energy. This energy has to be this precious. We should be able to recollect, re, uh, to call again the, 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 the force of occupation as an engine as the, the states are not in the physical space of the square. The real state, the real problem is in a totally disembodied place, which is the, the, the virtual form of power. How can we be able, when we, how will we be able to transfer the erotic energy that comes from the the physical space of the square into a cognitive ability to deconstruct the, uh, the power of, of financial capitalism. That is the problem. 
And I, I don't have the answer to this question, just I say that the, the displacement, the, the investment of this energy has to, to, to go towards the form of our expectations. The main problem in the relation between society and power is expectations. The, 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 the future is there. I mean, the, the, the capitalist modulation of future, the induction, the inoculation of economic, consumerist uh, expectations, competitive expectations in the, in the, in the body mind of the movement. So, the, 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 the strategy, the next step has to be don't forget about the square. The square is an important place to meet again and to feel the energy of the social body. But also, don't mistake the place as the, the, the square as the real place of, 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 the, of the change, of the transformation, because the real place is the square. It's in a sense, inside our, the connection of our minds. But isn't that already? Happening in a way. I mean, in, in after the future, you have a brilliant sociological, a brilliant sociological sketch. Frank writes, he looks at the group of precarious workers commuting towards work and he says, These people, what are they doing? They're listening to their mobile devices, they're texting, they're sharing the same metro, the same tube. Uh, but they're not, they're not, they're connected with the world, but they're not communicating. They're, they're completely unable to uh, form any kind of social framework amongst themselves. And I just asked myself, well, isn't precisely, well, to say the same thing that you just said, uh, it didn't occupy, um, produce that social fabric, that people met each other. I know this sounds terribly naive, but that they, they met each other, they formed new uh, forms of contact, and it wasn't that space that produces new possibilities, but the fact that they go home, do their own projects, uh, engage with other people that they other, otherwise hadn't met. I mean, look, I'll give you a specific example. I met André in Prague in 2000, just after the demonstrations against the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. André had just come out of prison for slightly misbehaving during the <laughs> demonstration. He viciously with his nose and uh, various other things, police uh, officers laying with his stomach, etc., etc., and my life has never been the same since. <laughs> we met, I mean, that was a chance meeting, and out of that friendship, a lot of other social fabric has been with them. Last but not least, we would be here, uh, here today discussing uh, uh, these things. And a lot, I don't know, as I said, I know this sounds terribly naive, but a lot can happen out of this. Now, I'll end again on a very naive note. Uh, Frank and I just, before we came into this roundtable discussion, we shared a sandwich together. And to me, yours.
optimism, to change the expectation, is then the ability to make richness, I mean, the redefining the concept and non concept, the perception of richness. What does it mean to be rich? Having many things in the
election collapse of 2008 has been the end of, uh, of modern capitalism and uh, a real systemic collapse. Uh, I am not even sure that it was a crisis in the sense of the economic crisis changing something in economic dynamics and so on and so on. What I see is that it has been a change in the social perception of the future of look at you and for 500 years we Europeans have been thinking that we are rich. We were exploiting the planet, we were enslaving black people and Asian people and so on and so on. We are where the master of the, of the planet. All of a sudden, we have been, from, I mean, overnight, we have been advised that we are poor and we have to think about the future in terms of, of poverty. Is it a, a honest distribution of wealth in the planet so Europeans become a little bit the good Chinese are becoming very rich and happy and uh, the, the, the Mexicans and black people and Africans and so on are better. No, the contrary is true. Europeans have become poor and unhappy because they are the bad example. Because Chinese workers would say, oh, an Italian worker uh, is uh, cashing thousand euros in a month. So that's a very bad example. So in that order as to become poor, take 600 euros for uh, his work. So the Chinese worker we understand that uh, um, exploitation is the only way and uh, misery is the only possible future that you can uh, Wait for by this point of view, the financial collapse has really changed everything. Well, the problem now is that the game has become very dangerous because if we are unable to find a way out, the future is already here. It's the dissolution of the Antarctica ice, just to name a, a possibility. It's uh, literally end of the social civilization. No.